Renewable energy from the sun is a great source of electricity, but it's very difficult to store it, which is why we're so reliant on fossil fuels like petrol. But what if you could harness the power of the sun with the storability and reliability of liquid fuels? I've come to Cambridge to meet some researchers who claim they have done just that, and it's all been inspired by nature. So the idea of actually creating an artificial leaf, how true to reality is it? So we very much look at nature and, and plant photosynthesis inspiration and there's a large global field known as artificial photosynthesis that really tries to mimic these aspects. So we look how we can take some little particles known as photons from lights to drive current, to use this current to make fuels and really this is largely inspired by natural photosynthesis. Photosynthesis is the process by which plants take water and CO2 from the atmosphere and convert them into energy and food. The process happens inside an organelle called a chloroplast. Here, photons from sunlight provide energy by exciting electrons from chlorophyll, a light-absorbing molecule. CO2 is reduced or receives electrons and the water becomes oxidised or loses electrons, converting them into sugars and other complex carbohydrates. Oxygen is produced as a byproduct. The difference is mainly that we try not to make sugars as in natural photosynthesis, but to make really energy carriers we can use as a fuel or as a chemical. That fuel is called syngas or synthesis gas which consists primarily of hydrogen, carbon monoxide and some CO2. So syngas is produced on a very large scale globally by the petrochemical industry and it's being made to produce hydrogen, to make fertilizers, to make methanol and hydrocarbons and also used directly in the petrochemical industry. But the problem with syngas today is that it's being made from fossil fuels, so we are emitting a lot of carbon dioxide and deplete our fossil resources. So in our process the idea is to really use carbon dioxide and water to make syngas sustainably. So synthesizing photosynthesis. I can't quite believe that this can be done in a lab, but apparently I'm going to find out. Hi, Virgil. Hello. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. So what happens here? Well, right now we are going to interface our uh, light absorber, perovskite, with uh, the catalyst that we use for CO2 reduction. Okay, that's a lot of complicated words. Yes. Um, for me, with my understanding, leaves in their actual purest form use carbon dioxide, sunlight and water to create energy. Yes. What part of the process is this bit? So basically we're mimicking natural photosynthesis by having two light absorbers which can be used to convert CO2 and water into a chemical form of energy storage. So here we will combine um, perovskite light absorber with a catalyst for CO2 reduction. So basically, we have the perovskite light absorber here. Perovskite is a mineral that absorbs light from the red end of the spectrum and releases electrons. And on this other side, we have the molecular catalyst, this dark sheet. Now, in order to connect both of them, we will need to use this thin metal layer which can melt at a low temperature and we will heat it up and cool it down fast in order to attach the light absorber to the molecular catalyst. Should we meld these two things together? Yes. So if you want to help me, could you please yeah. press the start button on the okay. computer? This one? So Virgil, we created this light-absorbing catalyst sandwich. What happens next? Well, next we are going to wire it and encapsulate it, and this will basically create half of our artificial leaf. Okay, so when you say half, why is it just half? Because this, this is just one light absorber, and afterwards, we will eventually contact it with the second light absorber, the bismuth vanadate. 
Bismuth vanadate is another mineral that absorbs mostly blue light and releases electrons. These are basically the two bits which will form in the end artificial leaf. So light will come from this side. It will first pass through the bismuth vanadate light absorber and create oxygen. And then a part of the light will reach the perovskite and on that side, it will drive the reduction of CO2 into CO and water into hydrogen. Can we see it in action? Yes, let's go. Yeah. But first, we need to add potassium bicarbonate to enrich water with dissolved carbon dioxide. It feels like you've combined the advantages of photovoltaic cells with the ready energy that you have with liquid fuels. I think that's a fair statement to some extent. What we do is make the connection. We use the best photovoltaic materials and then try to connect it with our catalysts to go to fuels directly. And in this, this case, yes, I think we, we work on the transition, how to use the light directly to store the energy in the fuel. So we're all set up. We've gone through various stages to get to this point. We've got the carbon dioxide, we've got the water, our device is immersed. All we're missing is the sunlight. Yes. So now we can switch the light on. Woo! And we can already see that the bubbles start forming. Yes. You can clearly see bubbles of hydrogen and carbon monoxide forming in these test tubes. And what's so exciting is that those are the key ingredients of liquid fuels that we may be using one day. The experiment's tiny, but the environmental impact could be huge. Even renewable energies have some kind of carbon footprint. Where does your technology sit on that spectrum? Depends on the whole life cycle analysis. But since we source from carbon dioxide, and if we take some of this carbon dioxide and don't release it again into the atmosphere, we have overall or net taken carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. And from this point, you can either make the fuel or you can really extract it as well. So I believe there's scope for carbon negative technologies as well on the way. So how long will it take before we're actually pumping the liquid fuel that you've generated through this process into our cars? So unfortunately, we are still decades away. And the reason is that our system it's quite inefficient, it's quite fragile, and it's also quite costly to produce at the moment. But we're excited because the concept works. So we, we know in principle it's possible. The next step is, of course, to address all these limitations. And once these have been addressed, we need to scale from a little drop to a massive volume to really produce meaningful amount of fuel. But it's not impossible, and it could really provide a solution to replacing fossil fuels then? I think there are many possibilities to make an impact. It's uh, transportation we have discussed and uh, transportation is important and I think sustainable fuels can have clear impact in transportation. But it can also have impact in the chemical industry. So one example would be steel manufacturing. So if you can source hydrogen cleanly, then this hydrogen can be used to make steel production more sustainable. And the same would be true for agriculture. With clean hydrogen, there's also a possibility to make fertilizer more sustainable. Once we reach a situation where we can make the syngas at low cost and significant scale, then we can feed in very easily in existing processes and make these sustainable. And these go directly into the petrochemical industry. I think there's a scope for a gradual transition to have today a fossil-driven petrochemical industry and slowly convert it into a sustainable industry. 